I'm Michael Garbutt. I'm a lecturer in the School of Design Studies here at COFA. I, I teach a master's program uh, called Design Seminar 3, rather prosaically, but more excitingly, The Great Debate, in which we look at themes of design, the ethics of design. What is design? Uh, what should it be? And how does it contribute to the good life. Because it seems to me and a lot of other people that on planet Earth these days we're on a kind of gigantic floating through space Titanic heading for the gigantic floating through space iceberg in the form of social, environmental, economic collapse. And I think design is the culprit. Have a look at this um, graph and if you look very carefully you can see that all of those indicators of effectively overconsumption, pollution, mass production, mania, and the culture of adrenaline driven consumption that we live in, it all starts at the very beginning of the 1850s. So, what happened in the early 1850s? Well, one thing that happened was the opening of the Great Exhibition in London at the Crystal Palace, and that was the world's first ever great exhibition and it was a display of manufactured items from around the world and for the first time ever the masses showed up to look at what they could desire, acquire and um, change their lifestyles by acquiring. And the actual place in terms of its building materials, its construction um, is a kind of proto shopping mall and it was, it's a a lightweight frame structure and it's arguably one of the, the uh, grandfathers of modernism in term, architecturally speaking, but much more importantly, socially speaking, the Crystal Palace represents, I think, the kind of designed society we live in. It was full of design, mass produced for people who would acquire it. And it became a kind of society of the spectacle and the making. And what I would argue um, is that the world we live in today, in a sense, is a gigantic crystal palace. The crystal palace was put up in a corner, a very large corner, of Hyde Park in London in a matter of weeks, and then subsequently dismantled and re-erected somewhere else. But in the meantime, it has, if you like, wrapped itself around the world. The entire world, not quite literally, but certainly metaphorically, is a kind of shopping mall. Global consumption, global production, a society of the spectacle where we're all, to a greater or lesser extent, pursuing stuff. There is just too much stuff in the world. I don't think anybody would deny that. And it's this pursuit of stuff that has created the kind of problems we're living with today. And so those are the kinds of things that I address in the Design Seminar 3, The Great Debate. We look at how design effectively contributes to this problem, but how much more importantly, design could be very different. How design could be what I like to think of as critical design, something that actually makes a difference to the world rather than making more of the problem. And I was um, focused on precisely this problem just recently when I was contemplating my own bathroom taps, because my bathroom, as you can see, has a, a tap which, by any standard design measure, is an ugly looking little tap. It's an ugly tap, and it's an embarrassing tap to have if you are teaching design, if you claim to be a designer, and people come perhaps into your bathroom, they, they think to themselves, gosh, what a tap he's got. I mean, how can he be, he's not a real designer if he's got a tap like that. Or well, so this voice inside my head said, and I thought to myself, no, I teach I teach the great debate. I know that the pursuit of aesthetic pleasure through visual acquisition, through, through status of having a better design tap is merely going to contribute to my own carbon footprint and hurtling towards the iceberg of social, environmental and economic collapse. Nevertheless, I thought I'd better check things out on the web. And so I, I had a search around for the kind of taps you can um, have a look at. And you can get taps that look wonderful, things like this. Uh, that is the, uh, the racing tap, I think it is. That's the, uh, the gear stick. It looks like a, I think it's an Alfa Romeo 
gear stick. So you can change gear as you drive through. Isn't that a wonderful thing to do? I mean, we need something like this, I'm sure. There's another beautiful looking tap. I mean, so graceful, elegant. It was uh, Vitruvius, the uh, Roman architect of classical antiquity, who talked about commodity, firmness, and delight as being the characteristics of good design. Well, I mean, you've got commodity and firmness, I'm sure that more than that, you have delight. Yes, and there, that's the gear stick. Yes, isn't that, that's a, a superb gear stick. You shift gear, you see. You rev up, you zoom around. I mean, what pleasures could there be there? Superb. This is a death's skull tap, uh, perfect for the kiddies. It's, it's available for a relative uh, low cost. I think it's bronze plated, quite delightful. Should I have that? Or should I, in fact, have the Blu-ray tap with light that pops out, lighting up the water. That had that'd, that'd impressed the neighbours, I thought. Or this one, this beautiful swinging, thrusting, resonated, well-lit, beautiful reddish tap, which I wonder if you can guess who actually designed it. That is a Zaha Hadid tap. Zaha Hadid, the Iraqi-born British based architect who does buildings that look just like that tap. They're bigger and water usually doesn't come out of them. There's a, another totally different wacky looking but super designy uh, kind of thing. And that's an image of the recent uh, tsunami or the effects of the tsunami in Japan where an awful lot of stuff, including water, got washed up and it seemed to me to kind of put my own bathroom tap issues into perspective. Uh, there's a bar on the top of uh, a hotel, I think, somewhere in Bangkok. Another designy kind of thing. I like the word designy. I heard it from one of the um, people I work with, because I'm not at Kofa. I run a design studio and television uh, production company. And uh, one day, the, one of the, the um, staff there were designing something. I, it was a graphic design for a logo for a program that we were doing. And I asked her why she did it in a particular way. And she explained to me, looking rather pained as though I just didn't get it. She said, because it's designy. Now, designy means cool, means sexy. It means it, it looks like a tap by Zaha Hadid. And that is a designy looking thing. So design has got us into this mess. And it's design, I believe, that can, that must, get us out. And that means radically rethinking what design is. So no more beautiful taps, please. Okay? We have to design for the real world. And this is nothing new. Uh, Victor Papanik, 40 years ago, wrote a book called Design for the Real World. Uh, not so long ago, uh, there was an exhibition at the Cooper Hewitt. There's a website, too, called Design for the Other 90%. Design shouldn't be about be cool, about sexy, about delight for the eye, for the body, for the senses. It should be about meeting real people's needs. And I think we have huge challenges socially, economically, and environmentally. We, we know we do, and that design can choose to be part of the problem or part of the solution. And joking apart, it's easy to make fun of the designy world we live in. But it's, it's deadly serious, quite literally. And I believe very strongly that we need to make a difference by the way we design. So critical design is what it should be. And I think that um, design schools like our own have a, a very important role to play in changing the agenda within the culture we live in. So that design no longer um, collocates with designer stubble, <laughs> but with real-world issues and real-world solutions. So, apart from complaining, well, what do I do about it? Or, not a great deal. Um, I, I do some paintings. That's one of my uh, drawings uh, called Manicville, uh, about the manic state of the world today. That's another one of the same thing. And there is Manicville multiplied by eight, because it's easy to do that with Photoshop the meaninglessness of it all. I'm interested in why we do what we do, so I, I kind of draw it, but I don't think it's enough to just draw the mess that we're in or even teach about it. I think one has to do something. So my latest project, which I guess straddles the world of, my professional world is making educational television or designing the programs for educational television. So I work in television, I suppose. But I'm also interested in um, using televisions as a kind of art form, but particularly destroying televisions. Just like I think a lot of taps, really, if not 
don't need to be destroyed. I think they need to be set quietly aside. And it seemed to me that the, um, the opening of Kofa, the new Kofa, when the, the sod is metaphorically turned uh, this year, was a fantastic opportunity to make a statement about design. So I've been collecting analog TVs, indeed any TV, but it's easier to get your hands on analog because people are less keen to give you their new LCD TV. So I've got all these old analogs and um, I'm piling them up waiting for the go to celebrate the turning of the sod by smashing the first TV. I'm going to drop these TVs from a very great height in Kofa, one after the other, and film them in 2,000 frames per second uh, fast video so that then we, when in playback we've got these beautiful slow-mo falling televisions gradually descending, and maybe I'll chuck in some taps for good measure, um, gradually falling slowly, slowly, slowly down and smashing, I hope, beautifully. And this will be my contribution to the great debate.